welcome to another episode of the Gospel Lifeline Podcast. My name is Neil Grogan, and I'm here with Matthew Statler. And we are once again, because we're doing back-to-back podcasts <laughs> on the same day without uh, Mr. Robert Kale. So, um, guys, we're sorry about our insufficiency. He completes us a uh, perfect number of kinda three. Like kind of like a, a weird trinity type thing uh, of bearded men <laughs> yeah there it's not the same when there's not three beards three yes. beards are better than two it's an old uh chinese haiku um uh, but <laughs> or a latin saying right yeah 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 roman <laughs> man uh we've been in this series the past couple weeks um when these have kind of released on the church and what the church is and church membership and and all these other things. But before we get into that today, we have our time to look at on this day in history. It is currently March 15th when we are looking at this. And on this day in history in 44 BC, Julius Caesar was stabbed to death by Brutus, Cassius, and several other Roman senators on the Ides of March in Rome. Beware, beware, the Ides of March. Mm. Yeah, man. So, uh, oh, oh, Cesar, Cesar uh, caught all the smoke, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he, he turns around and goes, et tu, Brute? Yeah. You too, Brutus? My homie, what are you stabbing me for, dude? Yeah. The most Nias closest is... advisor, his friend. Mm. That is takes a... Takes a knife and stabs him too. That is a great example of some serious betrayal in history, right? Some uh, straight up getting cut. Yeah. Like you you thought um, these people were for you, and it turned out that they um, would abuse or would undercut or would stab you literally in the back. The same, <laughs> a safe, a safe place. A safe place, yeah. The, yeah, in the in the Senate. And then get stabbed, right? Um, and which makes me think a lot about kind of a part of what we're going to talk about today in in the the topic of church hurt, um, where you thought you were in a safe place where these people are supposed to take care of you, supposed to love you or lead you, and you were betrayed. Maybe you felt figuratively stabbed, like Caesar uh, Julius Caesar uh, was literally stabbed. Um, but in church hurt, man, it, 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 it strikes to the cord. And, and for many, man, it's like, I'll never step foot in that place again. That's right. Yeah. It, and when we, you know, we see it in all types of churches, right? We see it from the small church to the big church and we see it from all the nominations. I mean, we, we know the, the, uh, the sexual abuse that is rampant in many denominations and, um, that's being revealed in more and more um, scenarios. So, man, I, I, I feel I feel it when people say, I just don't feel safe going to church. I can't trust people to deal with this stuff anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, what do you call it? A uh, resolution they might make as a believer is I'll do this on my own. And uh, right. I'll listen. I'll listen to preaching online. I'll read books. I'll read my Bible, and that's it's that. Safer. But I don't. It's safer. It's, yeah, it's safer in isolation, right? But what we know about isolation is that, um, man, that's where the enemy <laughs> takes us. Takes us out. It's quite easy. Man, um, this one time on deployment, um, they fed us some some dry, not dry. They fed us some uncooked chicken, right? Yeah. And so I, I go get my my little meal. I'm all ready to eat this chicken. I take a bite out of it and it's raw, still a little bit frozen. And I just want to vomit all over my plate. Right. Um, now it made it, it took me a while to want to eat chicken again after that, but I didn't swear off all food. Right. Mm -hmm. I just was a lot more discerning in looking at my food and my, my plate. I cut open the chicken a little bit, looked at what's inside, make sure that it was <laughs> yeah. taken care of properly. Yeah. And, and, I, and I really liken that to our church, man. We can't just yeah. not eat food anymore. We can't just right. not get nourishment, but we can be discerning. 
And I think yeah. that's really the key here is how do we identify? I mean, cause some people are like, well, the closest church I feel led to, I'm just going to walk right in. Right. And who knows what's there. Mm. So what, you know, how can we, how can we equip some of our listeners um, in finding a church that will not be perfect, but maybe on its way to health, maybe a good church? Yeah. Uh, what do you think, Neil? Yeah, I would say uh, as a caveat, I think it's important to note, especially with someone like the folks I've counseled who have extreme church hurt. Uh, I feel like I always have to remind them that there is no there is no such thing as a perfect church. And the reason for that is this three letter word called sin. And we have not all arrived. And what that means is that people are going to fail you. The institution might fail you in the future. Again, um, your pastor might say something that offends you and, and he's not even meaning to, <laughs> you know, uh, um, but, or not do what you exactly want them to do. And so, I just want to remind our listeners, man, you're still going to deal with the issue of sin um, in the church, but it's where is the church going? What direction are they going? What are what are some evidences of health in a church that I can look for? Because over the last several weeks, we've talked uh, in great length at this point about the necessity of being not only in a church, but as a member of a church, right? And so, man, we're we want to drive this home deeper. <laughs> well, what church should I be a member to? And so, man, there's this organization which Matt and I really love called Nine Marks, and uh, you can see them on NineMarks.org, um, org, and <laughs> they have many books. By the way, um, they've written books on you know church membership. There's a book called Nine Marks of a Healthy Church, or, which we're going to kind of cut up a little bit uh, for our purposes this, today and uh, and so on and so forth. So I'm just going to, Matt, if, if it's all right with you, I'm going to read the Nine Marks of a Healthy Church, and then we can kind of, you know, ec- kind of uh, ta- uh, tease that out a little bit as we yeah, go absolutely. forward. So. Yeah. So we'll go, we'll go one by, I'll read them all in the list and then we'll start at the top and go down. So starting with uh, preaching, a mark of a healthy church is always going to have biblical preaching. And we're going to tease that out in a second. Um, it's also uh, another mark of a healthy church is biblical theology, the gospel, conversion, evangelism, church membership, church discipline, discipleship, and leadership. So if you'll notice the first mark we began with is in preaching. Um, You know, Matt and I believe um, in in that the Bible calls us to a specific type of preaching as primary, as the supreme kind of preaching that should be done in in a church on Lord's Day, Sunday. And that is what's called expositional preaching. Mac, you want to give us a, a quick summary of what expositional preaching is and why it's so vital um, to as a mark of a healthy church? Underlying the idea of an expositional sermon is the, the idea that we believe that the Bible is God's word. And so if God mm-hmm. speaks, if God says, then we must obey and we must listen, we must do. And so as we open up God's word and we begin to, to tell people what God says, our job is not to interpret it, to add to it, to make up stories about it, but our job is to say what the text says. So ex- expository preaching essentially is pulling out from the text what the meaning is. What the main connect- idea is. The main idea, connecting it to today. Right Mm -hmm. to right now. So a lot of the, I mean, well, a lot of it, the Bible was written over a long period of time, a long time ago. But God, if God is the speaker, then it is is practical for every day. And so our role is not to discover and make up application, but to discover what's already there. And so that's, that's part of expository preaching and, and it can be topical. 
right? We could have a topic, but we want to always take the text of scripture and pull out from what it says. And the best way to do it really is going through the context. So going through a book of the Bible or a, a major section of, of scripture will allow us to see the full context of it. We can't just take a verse like I can do all things through, through Christ who strengthens me and then try to apply it to everything in everyday life. That's not what this is about. This is saying, man, Paul is in prison and he is about to suffer and probably get executed. And he's saying, you know what? To live as Christ, to die is gain, right? And so we're taking the context of scripture. We're pulling out the meaning of scripture um, and expositing it. So yeah, expository preaching, um, biblical preaching, text-driven yeah. preaching is one way it's been called. Man, all these names for it is, is just so important that you find a church that does that and that the pastor opens up God's word and says, turn with me in your Bibles to this passage, right? Instead of saying, let me tell you a story about a book and a song I heard and, and all yeah. these other things, right? That the, the goal is what did the Bible say? What did God say? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, you know, it's funny, even in my church's membership covenant, uh, we talk about the, the church members holding uh, leadership accountable to and, and guarding some certain things that happen at the church. And one of those things that we, communicates biblical preaching, a gospel centered ministry, um, the, the uh, practice of the ordinance or the execution of the ordinances and evangelism. And like, man, that we hold each other accountable to that. Right. And I always do when I do membership interviews with folks, and I did a bunch of them last week. Um, but one of the things uh, I told them was if I ever get up there at the pulpit close my Bible and say, guys, I'm going to tell you what I think today. And it's your duty as a church member to say, uh-uh, I don't want to, I don't want I don't care what you think. I want to know what the word says. Um, so why is expositional preaching important? Well, it's important because God's word is what convicts us. It's what converts us. It's what builds us up and sanctifies God's people. Preaching that makes the main point of the text, the main point of the sermon, makes God's agenda rule the church and not the preacher's agenda. And so when we're looking for a what a healthy church is, we begin with how do they preach the word of God? What do they believe about the Bible and how do they preach? And uh, man, like you said, Matt, topicals, okay, but if it's all they do, um, man, you're not going to be getting the whole counsel of the Lord. And that's what they're called to do. <laughs> and so um, that pastor or preacher needs to take that very serious, seriously. The next mark of a healthy church uh, we see is in biblical theology. So biblical theology, a uh, uh, very simple way of saying what it is. Well, it is sound doctrine. It's right thoughts about who God is and it is belief that accords with scripture and not opinions, right? Um, what's a good example you think of where a church has a, I mean, don't name the church, but a church that has abandoned biblical theology and started just, this is whatever I conceptualize about God. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know of a particular church, but I do know that there have been churches that have said things like we need to unhitch from the Old Testament, mm -hmm. right? Or the God of the Old Testament is not the God of the New Testament or anything that, that pits Scripture against Scripture, um, God's Word against God's Word. Mm -hmm. Man, that's—but we see that kind of stuff, right? We see, totally. oh, well, God doesn't send the rain kind of um, theology— that's just not biblical. We, if we take the whole counsel of God and we say, what does God say? Well, then that's what we need to use. We don't need to, to come up with our own ideas or, or maybe when, when we take one attribute of God as, as opposed to his other attributes yeah, um, and, 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 and break him apart as if he's some kind of non um, single being. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's the big one I see is where uh, maybe a church highlights a specific attribute of God, and that, that they're going to make everything about that attribute. Um, I think a good example in, in uh, Christian liberalism is that they say God is love, right? Right. And that is solely what he is. And that's his nature. And so because God is love, he wants us to love. And we're going to love in whichever way we seem fit. Um, that's right. We make our own definition of love. Right, which is wrong belief about God. Um, The entire Bible, people, teaches sound doctrine. And so it's not, we don't part it out. We look at the word as a whole um, to how we understand the things about God because it is God's revelation of himself to us. It's what he wants us to know about him. And so why is biblical theology important? Well, it's important for evangelism. Uh, the gospel is doctrine. So sound doctrine is necessary for evangelism. It's also essential for discipleship. Um, Jesus um, says to teach them all that I have commanded you in the Great Commission, right? Um, it's essential for unity. We talked about with church membership statement of faith is is how is a document that unifies us under how we interpret scripture, how we understand scripture, things about God and worship. And biblical theology is essential for worship. Tell us about the two principles, Matt, for how we uh, how we do church. Yeah, I mean, you have the the regulative principle, and then. Um whatever the other one is, the general principle, I guess. <laughs> uh, the regulative means if if scripture doesn't say to do it in worship, then you don't do it in worship. The other one is if scripture doesn't forbid it or prohibit it, then you can you know do whatever is not prohibited. And I think it kind of comes back to in how do we how does how do we interpret scripture? Well, Scripture interprets Scripture, and so when we when we start saying, "Well, God is love," He's revealed Himself as love in this passage, and then you you don't look at the whole canon, the the entire horizon of Scripture, and compare it, then then you're missing the full counsel, right? And then we've talked about that, but yeah, it really does affect how we worship, and so there are some who are very strict on this regulative principle of worship and some who are much looser. And we'll see things like, um, well, Bible doesn't say you can use an instrument. So therefore we are only going to use our voices. But Mm -hmm. I think a case can be made that there is plenty of instrumentation in scripture. Um, Look at some of the, um, the Psalms and how it it talks about worship. The liar. The liar. Yeah. Particularly used for the liar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the other principle uh, is called the normative principle, right? Normative, yeah. Yeah, and so you know, we would say, man, we we do the regulative principle, but you know, specific things like which chairs to sit in, you know, <laughs> that's not in there, or what light bulbs to use in your church. You know, we we make decisions, also, yeah. but the things that the Bible says to do, we do them. A couple well, of things. An example. That, yeah, give yeah. us some examples, Neil. Yeah, uh, one of the things the Bible calls us, commands us to do is to preach the word um, in season in season and out of season, right? Like um, that we are gathered around hearing the apostles teaching. Uh, another thing the, that the Bible commands us to do uh, in, in worship is pray, is to sing. Um, it's to... Um, exercise the one another's, you know, so we, we see a lot of, uh, examples like that. Um, things that we would say it doesn't tell us to do is call down fire from heaven, <laughs> you know, or, like, or a drama, right? Or I yeah. Mean, or a, a play, drama. a skit. Yeah. But it calls us to pray, to read, to preach, to sing like, and to exercise the church ordinances. So to do the Lord's supper, um, and, and to baptize when the opportunity arises for that. Okay, moving forward. Um, the third mark of a healthy church is the gospel. Um, the good news, um, just to give you kind of a synopsis of what the gospel is, and I think we have uh, in the future going to kind of do a series on this, but the good news is that the one and only God who is holy made us 
in his image to know him. That's our intended purpose. But we sin and cut ourselves off from him. But in his great love, God became a man in Jesus and lived a perfect life, died on the cross, thus fulfilling the law of God himself and taking on him for himself the punishment for the sins of all those who would ever turn from their sins and trust in him. Then we see that God, that Christ rose again from the dead, showing that God accepted Christ's sacrifice and that God's wrath against us had been exhausted. And he now calls us to repent of our sins and to trust in Christ alone for forgiveness. If we repent of our sins and trust in Jesus, we are born again into this new life and eternal life with God. And he is gathering, God is gathering one new people to himself among all those who submit to Christ as Lord. So that's like a, a quick, very quick synopsis of the gospel, right? And, and not teased out, but man, Romans 1 through 4 gives us this a picture in its entirety. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4 also give us a su- kind of a summary statement of the gospel. Um, if you're, if the church does not have a right view of the gospel and it is not the driving force of what they do, they're not preaching it, they're not calling people to repentance and faith, then you need to run because they're about building their own kingdom and not the kingdom of, of God. Matt, what are your thoughts? Man, I think that's a phenomenal summary. We should all memorize that and, and use it in everyday evangelism. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be honest, I stole a good chunk of that from Nine Marks. So yep, go see yep. ninemarks.org. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, but you're, you're exactly right. That's what we center our whole lives around. Man, Philippians, uh, I'm preaching through it, so my heart's full of it right now. But mm. when we see Paul talking about things, it's because of your partnership, your koinonia in the gospel, your fellowship in the gospel, because of your partnership with me in the gospel from the first day until now, right? He just keeps bringing up the gospel. And that's shorthand for everything that Neil just said. Mm. And Paul didn't care about building his kingdom, but he cares about the gospel, the gospel preached. If other people preach it in order to try to get him in more trouble, go for it, right? Mm. As long as the gospel, the essential gospel is being sent. And that's, you know, that's what Neil and I, we desire for you is to find a church that holds to the gospel, right? We're not trying to build our churches through this podcast. We're not trying to build our kingdom through this podcast. We Mm. want you to find a gospel centered church. And that's, I mean, that's, if you can take anything else away from us, that's what we want you to take. Yeah, hold fast to that. The fourth um, mark of a healthy church is is conversion, uh, a church that is rightly converting people. So what that means is they're not just saying pray a prayer, you know, slap you on the butt and kick you down the road. Um, Repeat after me. Oh yeah, now you're saved. Ha ha. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> you did. You didn't even do it on purpose. I still yep. gotcha. Yeah, that's not what we're talking about. Well, conversion uh, or a biblical understanding of conversion recognizes both what God does and what people do in salvation. So, what God does in salvation he gives life to the dead. Uh, or Ezekiel 36, 26 would say, he turns a heart of stone into a heart of flesh and then breathes his spirit into it. Uh, he gives God gives sight to the blind. The Bible says about itself that it makes us wise into salvation. And so um, what else does God do is he gives gifts. He gives the gift of faith and repentance. Repentance is a mark of a changed heart. And what 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 does uh, conversion require of people um, to repent of their sin and to believe in Jesus? And so, man, this is have a, a church that understands conversion as the Bible teaches it. Um, it recognizes that only God can save; that they can't save people. I've heard it said in the past. Uh, you know, who are you bringing to heaven with you? You know. Well, the answer is nobody. You're not bringing anybody to heaven with you. Get that notch on your belt. Yeah. Yeah. No, God brings people. He's the one who gives the gift of faith. He's the one who changes the heart. All of those things. So um, it's so important that the church has a right view of conversion. 
Another mark of a healthy church is evangelism. Matt, what's evangelism? Well, of course, it's it's sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, right? I mean, we're going and telling people of this good news, but we risk a problem here, right? So one of the reasons why this is a mark of a healthy church is because it is the church's job to evangelize. So often people are like, well, I pay the pastor to do that, or I send this guy off to do that. And the reality is, no, you are to share the gospel with words, right? We are to tell people about Jesus Christ and lead them to a greater understanding of this and then allow God to do the transformative work that he does. The problem we see is that churches will try to shortcut this method and do it on their own. And so they'll say they'll attract as many people as they can. And if they combine that with a poor view of conversion, the next thing you have is a church that is full of um, what, what I like to call unsaved Christians, quote unquote, right? They're not really saved, but they're calling themselves Christians. And what that does more damage to the bride than, than not. And so this, this idea of evangelism, of sharing the good news, um, I'm not exactly sure all the details about why it's a, a mark of a healthy church has been a while. Maybe, maybe when they think about the crusades and um, we're going <laughs> to go and we're going to force people to become Christians through bloodshed, right? That's a very bad view of evangelism um, or, you know, some of the, the odd stuff like uh, evangelism should be left to professionals. Um, and then it becomes, people are going to ask you, why is it such an ego trip? Right. And, and many, many unbelievers will look on that and say, man, you're just doing that to get yourself higher up in the roles of heaven or some some kind of weird thing. And, and evangelism is just us celebrating the good news of what Christ has done, being heralds of the gospel, announcing that the king has come. And this is that now is the time to, to, to repent and turn to him. Um, I, I think the, the imagery of a king who just conquered a land and the, and all the people run out from him and go to all the villages around and say the king has come the king has come get you know stop rebelling stop being traitors now is your chance for pardon and and when the king's army arrives now's you know now's your chance to go ahead and submit and that that's what we're doing we're just saying listen the king has come yeah. he has defeated satan and now's our time to turn away and and enjoy true fellowship with him while we have the chance. And um, anyways, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Now. Evangelism, it clarifies our role in the mission of God, the mission that God has given the church. Uh, that's right on uh, another mark of healthy church. We've talked about at length, so we don't have to go in great detail is membership, right? Um, yep. We membership in so the local important. church. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll, refer to uh, episode two on this series right. for this. Uh, but next we'll go to uh, discipline, church discipline. Everybody hates this one, but it is a role, the role of the church to guard the gospel, um, to um, guard the saints, to hold accountable to what Christ calls us to. Um, what has been your experience? Um, the, what is the positive experience of church discipline? What is the, the aim of church discipline? Man, so Neil, this is such an important topic that we could probably spend hours on. Totally. Um, well, we have to have church membership to have church discipline. Mm -hmm. And in church discipline, I, I remember reading a story about a church in the South um, you know, back before slavery was outlawed, before it was prohibited, and there was a it was a meeting, an elder elder meeting, and there was a slave who basically brought up the fact that one of the members was beating his other slaves, mm. and he brought it up to the elders, and the elders then decided that they were going to send two men, two elders, to go and talk with that man, and basically church use church discipline to teach him that he does not treat people that way. Um, and then another example was when people were not coming to church anymore 
and they commissioned two people to go and find them. And what the whole goal was, was reconciliation, not, not removal, right? So when we catch someone maybe committing adultery against their spouse and they they want to bring their girlfriend and come in front of all their kids with their girlfriend to church. Our responsibility is to go and confront that man and tell him to put put that aside, put that away, and turn and repent to his wife yeah. and make it right if she'll have him, yeah. right? And 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 that's the goal is not to kick him out, but there is teeth to church discipline mm-hmm. because it's a mechanism to ensure the church remains as pure as possible on this side of heaven and yeah. and hold people accountable right and, and it, yeah. it does give the church a black eye if someone who is let's say he's a greedy lawyer and all he does is 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 jip people and when they ask him oh what church do you go to he says oh i go to this church down the road man no one's going to want to go to that church where that that kind of people are at yeah, right. That gives not. that gives the church a black eye. So, man, church discipline is so necessary. It's not a bad thing. It can be done beautifully and well. Um, and it's it's really an encouragement to our faith Yeah, because we know someone is going to call us on our sin and it's going to entice us back um, to Christ. Yeah. The goal of church discipline is always restoration. Um, a good kind of example of maybe what it is. Um, it's the stake that uh that you stake in the ground to help a tree grow straight right um and so (laughs) when it that thing starts getting crooked right church discipline is what is the corrective uh, aspect or um thing you do to grow strong yeah so that we can go strong and and in the right direction as a whole body not just as some so the whole body part you know is is a part of this process and I've seen elders and and uh, congregants alike go under this, um, or, or not elders anymore. They've disqualified themselves at that point. But you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. To remove, finish out, remove them. Yeah, yeah. To finish out our last two marks of a healthy church, and then we'll um, tee up kind of some more practical stuff and. And some more stuff on um, um, church hurt on the next episode, but the last or the last two is discipleship and leadership. So discipleship is vital in the context of a healthy church. Um, a church will not be healthy unless it is making disciples, not just baptizing them but walking them through a process to make them wise about salvation, wise about who God is, wise about how to conduct yourself in life as a believer. That is a process of discipleship that happens in many different ways. Sunday school, one-on-one small groups, discipleship groups, so on and so forth. But what it is in its essence is it's a group of people who have come together to fellowship with one another, to go deep in the word, to grow in wisdom and knowledge about God, each other, and how to live as Christians and with the aim of giving God glory in all things. And so we do that together and we grow together. We become more like Christ together. It's important because none of us are finished products. Until we die, all Christians will struggle against sin. And we all need help in the fight against sin. So uh, we get to we get to war against our flesh and against the enemy together. And that is uh, discipleship. And that's 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 the mechanism for growth. Uh, and then our last mark of a healthy church is in leadership. Um, Matt, what does the Bible say that leadership lo- should look like in the church? Because there's so many you, in so many churches, you're going to see this in a many many different ways. Yeah, I think people have have gone a little overboard in in some ideas of what the church should um, be led by more by human tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, than biblical knowledge. And so when we look at, 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 when we canvass the New Testament, when it talks about um, the local 
church. It's led by a group of men. Um, it's a plurality. There's several elders, uh, mature Christians who have shown themselves to be mature, been tested, have hands laid upon them, um, and have been chosen for the task of overseeing, of leading the church. Um, and they have qualifications that they're required to fulfill. And if they don't meet those qualifications, they should not be elders. They should not be leaders in the church. And see so First church Timothy. Leads, see First Timothy three for those qualifications. Right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Titus as well. Um, and and that emphasizes to me that I could never live three or four lifetimes and get the uh, accumulated knowledge that these men that I serve with have. So as an elder, elder and a pastor in the church, I'm able to um, lean on these guys. And some of them have been contractors, right? Just lay men through their whole lives. And they can say something like, you don't have um, this, this contractor you want to hire to do the windows doesn't have insurance. Don't hire him. And that will save me from a lot of, um, a lot of my trouble. And so, man, this is such a beautiful thing. I, it's, it's unfortunate that it's been abused and, and damaged. Yeah. Um, there's there's models out there like the Moses model, right? Where they say Moses is the the head guide, and then he has a bunch of elders um, taking kind of an Old Testament passage out of out of context. Yeah. Um, and so a plurality of men committed to the church, man. That's that's a beautiful thing in the life of a body. Yeah. Why it's important for the church? Well, it's because God gifts churches with elders to feed God's sheep uh, with His Word to guide his sheep, to protect the sheep from attackers, from wolves, uh, and then while protecting both themselves and the church through the wis wisdom of, like you're saying, Matt, the plurality aspect, right? And these um, elders are shepherds, right? We yeah. want to emphasize that. Yeah. We call so, them pastors. <laughs> yeah. So um, let, let me say it this way. The bottom line is biblical church leadership is important because without it, uh, God's people are like sheep with no shepherds, just yeah. wandering the wilderness. And so um, a healthy church includes these nine marks in them. Um, look for those things, discern those things. If you're considering a certain church, meet with the pastor there, ask him, walk him through these things. Where is this? How does this work in this church? You know, it's okay to ask those kind of questions if he doesn't have an answer then, um, you know, prayerfully consider what's next for you and your family. And we really want to emphasize that these nine marks are a beautiful, wonderful thing. It's kind of like a nice rose. We mm -hmm. do not take it and beat someone over the head with it because we have decided that we know the best thing that needs to happen. And so we're going to abuse. These are a tool for you to identify a healthy church. And these are tools for Neil and I to make sure that we are pursuing a healthy church in our congregation. This is not totally. to go to every church in town and scream at them and start yelling about the nine marks, right? This is, um, there, there is a, a nine Marxist label out there that's been floating <laughs> around because, because people are exceedingly passionate and they damage the value of this. No one's going to listen to someone who's screaming at them yeah. to do better. So we yeah. want to lovingly bring people on to this, this model of church. This, yeah, this is a great uh, gauge. Um, what would be your non-negotiables? I mean, all of these are non-negotiable in my mind, but if I was going to say which three must be there or else um, it's going to burn in front of you, <laughs> I would say uh, um, preaching. Look yeah. for a preaching that's done expositionally. Um, discipleship. Oh gosh. Okay. I might go to four <laughs> <laughs> discipleship. You got to grow. Um, and that show that's a, that's a, uh, there's a model for growth, spiritual growth in that church and for fellowship. Um, the gospel, they got to get the gospel right or else, um, man, they're going to fall. It's going to fall flat. And, uh, lastly, uh, I think the, Okay, I'll go top five. <laughs> membership. Go top nine. Yeah, top nine. No, I, I would say membership and, um, and evangelism. So you have um, biblical preaching happening on the Lord's Day. 
In that biblical preaching, they're giving you the one and true gospel, and the gospel is driving what they do as a church. Uh, next, you have uh, a, a church that is growing in, in their knowledge and wisdom of God and one another in discipleship. They are members of a local body who are caring for one another, carrying each other's burdens, rejoicing with one another, holding leadership accountable, all of those things, and moving forward in the same unified direction. And lastly, they are exercising the mission of God in evangelism in their community, both locally and internationally, right? And so I would say, man, if you were to grab five of them, uh, the, grab those five. Don't don't let go of those five things. And uh, uh, I don't. And Matt, would you change any of those? Or I mean, historically, Luther, I think, I believe he said that there are three, and it's the preaching, and then the ordinances or the sacraments is what he would call them. Yeah. Um, and so when when we say that these are are marks of a healthy church. We're not saying that these are the only things you have to have for a healthy church um, or even the maximalist or minimalist of what we need. But um, yeah, ultimately this is a gauge. Yeah. And so I think you're right. Those five, um, the gospel expo expository preaching, discipleship and growth and evangelism. Um, I might switch evangelism and conversion um, yeah. because if you get conversion, right, you might get evangelism, evangelism right. right. Hopefully. <laughs> so yeah, man, that's, yeah. That, but that's that's it, man. That's what we need. Yeah. Okay, so um, go forward. If you don't have a church, look for one. Use this as a, a kind of a gauge, a litmus test. And, uh, man, I just want to encourage you to find a church to start getting attending, uh, inquiring, understanding, and, man, worshiping God with a community of believers. Um, until next time, guys, this is an another episode of the Gospel Lifeline Podcast. Thanks for listening. We out.